Have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2, and uh, we're continuing our series through Philippians, and we're going to be looking at verse, oh yes, those children. Uh, we have any others who would like to go? Children, that is. Okay. <clears throat> In Philippians chapter 2, we're going to begin looking at verse 16. We concluded there last week and just made reference to that verse. But uh, we're going to begin there today. And uh, look at it with me, if you will. We'll read down through verse uh, 24. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy us shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your estate. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. But ye know the proof of him, that as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. In verse 24, we'll conclude there. But I trust in the Lord, I also myself shall come shortly. Today I want to speak to you on the topic of the title, Church Gifts. Now, a lot of times whenever we just hear those words, Church Gifts, we quickly have our minds to go, well, someone has made a donation of something to the church. Well, no, not necessarily. Not in that sense am I speaking this morning. It is true that, that uh, in that ideal of thought to some degree, but it goes much further than that. For instance, let me see if I can get to where I want to go. Number one, if you're saved, if you have come to know Christ, you have received a gift. It is called the gift of eternal life. It is eternal. God has given it unto you because you have come to the place to, by faith, trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And so, therefore, you have received a gift based upon those those facts, and if you have experienced those facts in your life. Number two, whenever you received the gift, you were also gifted. In other words, you received the gift of salvation, and whenever you did, God took and also implemented within you another gift. It is a gift in which he gave you in order that you may be a contributor to the function and the healthiness of the body of Christ. Amen. Now the Bible tells us about those gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He speaks of those. And uh, some have the gifts of administration, some have the gifts of help, some have 
have the gift of uh, ministry, some have the gift of preaching, some have the gift of teaching, some have other gifts, but uh, some have the gifts of helps. Uh, but everyone who is under the sound of my voice, who has ever come to know Christ, yes, you have received the gift of eternal life, but in that moment that you you did receive that gift. God took and implemented within you something else. He implemented within you a gift uh, that he gave you for the benefit of the body of Christ. But then there's a third. Not only have you received a gift, not only have you been gifted, but you are to be a gift. To the body of Christ. Let me say that again. You are to be a gift. Now you have received a gift of salvation. And God gave that to you. Uh, it was by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It cost you nothing. But it cost him everything. He purchased you. You don't belong to yourself. You belong to him. Because God has gifted you. He's given you a gift. And in that, he gifted you. In other words, he imp implemented something within you, an ability in order that you might function in a certain place within the body of Christ and serve him and honor him there, that the church may be healthy and the church may flourish. And also... Not only have you been gifted, but you are to be a gift. That is, you are to use that gift in his body. You're to use it in his body. Now, that gift has to be developed. It has to be developed. And what is so sad, listen to me very carefully, what is so sad is that so many people, yes, come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Yes, God implements within them this gift, but they never do anything about developing the gift because in order to develop the, the gift, you have to go through schooling of hard knocks. And God has to take you through stuff in order to develop you in order to bring you to the place to where you can properly use the gift. But I want you to note three things this morning. As Paul here was writing, Paul had just spoke about working out what God had worked in through salvation in Jesus Christ. And we find here some of the instruments or the gifts, or, and better yet, the personalities that God has given to the church in order to assist the church, assist the body of Christ to grow in the likeness of Him. And so I want you to note there are three traits that are here. We're going to be looking at another one of these personalities next week. But there are three traits that I want us to notice that we can find in the lives of these two that are mentioned here within our text. The first trait that we find in a person who has come to that place, who has not only been saved, not only understood that they received a gift in order to use the working life, but they have developed that gift to where they are now in the position of using it. And I want you to note some of the traits that an individual has whenever they get to that point, to where they are usable in the body of Christ. First of all, I want you to note the first trait is the trait of desire. The Apostle Paul was writing, if you'll note there in that verse 16, the Apostle Paul was writing there, and he was talking about, the first thing that he talked about was fruitful. That is, sharing the Word of God, holding forth the Word. Now, whenever he was talking about holding forth the Word, he wasn't talking about just holding it forth as far as proclaiming it with the lips. He was talking about holding it forth by proclaiming it with your life. 
And folks, if you're not proclaiming it with your life, you need to hold up on proclaiming it with your lips. Because your life is going to counteract whatever you say with your lips. So you need to back up what you're preaching. Amen? Amen. And so it doesn't mean perfection. I'm not talking about perfection there. But I am talking about being at a place to where you have a Christian witness and you identify with Jesus Christ. And so here he's talking about being fruitful. He says, I have a desire that there be a fruitfulness in your life. And whenever a person comes to the place of reaching that point, that level of, of maturity and that development uh, to where they are usable in the body of Christ, they will have that desire for fruitfulness not only in their own personal lives, they will have it there, but they will desire it in the lives of others. They'll want others to be developed in Jesus. They'll want others to grow in Him. They will want others discipled. They want others to be mentored. They want others to grow in Christ. But then I want you to note a second thing in relationship to desire. No one does Paul here speak of fruitfulness, but he also speaks of fearfulness. There's another thing that has to do with a person who has a desire. No one do they desire fruitfulness, but they also at the same time have this fearfulness. Because Paul went on to say, if you'll look there in verse 16, he went on to say, he says, one of my fears is that I run the race in vain. In other words, all the time that I put in, every, every hour, uh, every, every moment, all the energy that I put in, I don't want to be to where I put it in and it be in vain. There is a fearfulness that is in the life of a person who has come to that place in their spiritual development to where they are at the point that God is able to use them because they have developed that gift or gifts and they are at the maturity level to where it's not about them, it's about others, but yet they have this fear of running in vain. They don't want to waste their time. They don't want to do that. They want it to be used for the glory of God. According to one study, and I received this off of Facebook this week, a pastor uh, took and posted it, and uh, I took and, and uh, looked at it. But anyway, it had to do with, with uh, five things that discourages pastors. And uh, one, of the, one of the five things, according to, to this study that was done, that causes discouragement among pastors is the lack of spiritual growth and maturity uh, within the church in which they pastor. You know, one of the greatest joys I get, brothers and sisters, is seeing you develop and seeing you grow in your knowledge and your understanding and seeing God change your life. That's one of the greatest blessings I have in the ministry. And it should be in the life of every pastor. But not only is it so in the life of of a pastor. It is so in the life of every person who has come to that place to where they are in the body of Christ uh, to the point to where not only are they being ministered to, but they're ministering because they have developed the gift or the gifts that God has given them. And it tickles them. It's a blessing to them to see others grow in the likeness of Jesus Christ. And so, listen, I want you to note 
that whenever it comes to church gifts, whenever it comes to church gifts, one of the characteristics of a person who is there to where they're able uh, and they're qualified, they have the ability to use their gifts, is that they will have the trait of desire in their life. Are you there? Have you gotten there yet? Or is your life still, you know, it's about you and you know what's going on in your family, what's going on in your job? You know, and everything else is secondary to you. As far as Christ and his service, you know, you, you show up on Sunday. And you're in the Word maybe on Sunday because the preacher after all is up here preaching. But yet until the next Sunday, it's just, you know, it's limited to that. I hope not. I hope and pray that you've applied yourself to develop and to grow and to discover and implement the gift or gifts that God has given unto you. No, you may not be able to sing. You may not be able to carry a note on a piano. Don't feel bad. The only note I can carry is on a radio. Not everybody is gifted in music. Not everyone is gifted in other areas, but you're gifted in something. God has given it to you. And you need to be developing it. And if you are at the point of development, there will be a desire in your life that wasn't there before. But then I want you to know a second thing. Not only do we find here uh, the characteristic or the trait of desire, we also find the trait or the characteristic of distance. In verses 17 and 18, the Apostle Paul speaks there. And listen to what he says. Yea, and if I be offered upon uh, the sacrifice and the service of your faith. I joy and rejoice with you all. Now I want you to note how far the Apostle Paul was willing to go. And this is the characteristic of any person who has come to this level in their Christian maturity. And that is that they're willing to go the distance. You say, what do you mean, Brother Tommy? What I mean is that they are running a marathon, and they're not planning on, they're not planning on stopping in between. They're not planning on quitting before they get to the end. They're willing to go the distance in the lives of other people, no matter what it takes. The Apostle Paul mentions two things. Number one, he mentions sacrifice. He says, I'm willing to be that sacrifice. Now, I want you to think with me for a moment. You understand what he's talking about here, don't you, whenever you're talking about sacrifice. The Bible tells us about Isaac. Isaac was willing to be, uh, have his hands tied uh, by his father and be bound and be placed upon an altar to be sacrificed, the Bible says in the book of Genesis. And we don't find the first complaint from him. There is a question whenever uh, uh, he asked his father, Father, what about the lamb? What about the sacrifice? And Abraham told him, he says, Son, God will provide the sacrifice. And he didn't understand that until they got to the top of Mount Moriah that he was going to be that provided sacrifice. And without a word, he allowed himself to be bound and laid upon that altar. Here Paul was saying, I'm willing for your sake to be laid upon the altar of sacrifice. Folks, you realize what kind of price there is in sacrifice, that means that you lay it all on the altar. Everything there is about you, it doesn't matter. You lay it all on the altar. No reservations. 
know nothing. You're willing to forfeit everything for the sake of somebody else. And Paul said, I'm willing to be that sacrifice. But then he mentions another word there in verse 17. If you will look at it, he uses another word. Not only does he say that I'm willing to go the distance in sacrifice, he says I'm willing to go the distance in service. Now, that word service there carries with it the word servant. The word servant means slave. In other words, if you were a slave, you receive all of your instructions from someone else. You don't do what you want. You do what they want. You belong to someone else. You are a literal slave for the benefit of others. In other words, if you're a slave, if you're in service, if you're a servant, you are, you are at the state that you are the lowest of the low for the benefit of other people. And Paul said, listen, I'm willing to go the distance. I'm willing to go to the place of service to being a slave, the lowest of the low, I'm willing to sacrifice, give totally of myself, forfeit everything for your sake. You see, Paul was willing to go the distance. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 5, listen to what he says about us as it describes the saint. He says, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, listen to this, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Spiritual what? Sacrifices acceptable to God by Christ Jesus. And so here, Peter says, as Paul describes it in his own life, he says that we are a priesthood, spiritually speaking, and we offer up sacrifices. But you know what? In our lives, whenever it comes to us, the spiritual sacrifice that we as a holy priesthood, we present are not lambs that belong to somebody else but it's our lives that we have been willing to give up for everybody else and so here he says I'm willing to go the distance let me ask you this morning have you come to the point in your life and I realize that I'm getting down to the nitty gritty but you understand that before I ever preach to you, I have to get down to the nitty-gritty whenever it comes to Tommy White. That I preach to me before I ever preach to you. I have to apply this to me before I ever apply it to you. Have you come to the place? Have you come to the place to where you have been willing to say, I, I am going the distance that I'm willing to be that sacrifice, that I'm willing to be the lowest of a low, I'm willing to be that slave for the benefit of somebody else, that others may grow in Jesus Christ. You know, I thank God for mothers. And sometimes fathers, because fathers are, are, some of them are willing to do that as well. But whenever a, a mother has a small infant, if that mother's a caring mother, 
that mother is willing to be up several times a night to answer the call to that crying baby. Whatever is sickly, she will hold it all night long. She will go hours without rest. And sometimes that father will too, if he's a caring father. He'll do that. And they do it not for themselves, but they sacrifice themselves for the sake of that baby. They are a lot of babes in Christ that we need to be parents to. And we need to come to the place of being that sacrificial, spiritual parent to be there, to nurture them, to give them that bottle. And yes, get them to the place to where they'll eat some solid food and get them to growing and help them to be healthy so that they can be strong in Christ Jesus. There's a price to pay. And Paul said, I'm willing to go the distance. Are we willing, brothers and sisters, to go the distance for the sake of somebody else? But then I want you to note a third thing. And that is, not only do we find here the trait of desire, not only do we find here uh, the trait of distance, but we, all find, we also find here the trait of dependability. Listen to what he says about Timothy, and we will quickly close. Listen to what he says about Timothy. He says in verses 19 through 22, he says, first of all, whenever it comes to Timothy, and he says, I'm going to be sending Timothy to you, he says, Timothy can be trusted. That's basically what he says in this verse. Uh, he says uh, in verse 19, but I trust in the Lord to send Timothy shortly to you. He's trusting the Lord but he's also putting confidence in Timothy. In other words, Timothy is dependable. He can be trusted. In verse 19, he is trusted as a communicator. In verse 20, Paul trusts him as a person of character. He says no one he could depend upon more than he could depend upon Timothy. Timothy can be trusted. If I send Timothy to you, I'm not going to have to wait, wait, uh, uh, lay awake at night wondering because I can depend upon Timothy to do what is necessary. Timothy can be trusted. Not only as a person of character, not only as a communicator, but also as a person of conduct. He says in verse 21 there, he says, For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. Now I personally believe that Apostle Paul is speaking of generality here that in the, in the lives of, of so many that they seek their own. But whenever it comes to Timothy, that's not the case. He's not seeking his own. His life is not about him. It's about others. And so I know that I can send Timothy to you because he's not going to be focused upon himself, his own personal benefit, but he's going to be focused upon your benefit. And so he says... He's a person that's dependable whenever it comes to conduct because he's going to be caring about you and what's happening with you. But then I want you to note another thing here when it comes to the characteristic or the trait of being dependable. Not only, not only do we find here the trait of being dependable in that he can be trusted Listen, Timothy could be trusted because he was already tested. Look in verse 22. For we know the proof of him 
that as soon as, uh, brother, as son with the Father, he has served with me in the gospel. The word proof there means to test. In other words, uh, it means that uh, in the Greek, that word proof means doku ime. And it uh, is defined as experienced having been through trials. In other words, Timothy, even though he was a young man, he had been put through the fire. He had been on the battlefield. He had been proven. He was trusted because he was already tested and he passed the test. He had served as a servant. He knew what it was to be a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ in sharing the gospel. He had a servant's mind. And he had a servant's training. You know why I say that? It is because it's obvious that in Timothy there was this teachable spirit. You never find in the life of Timothy, you never find in any of his personal or personality characteristics, you never find this, this implication that he was arrogant, that he was a know-it-all, or you could not tell him anything. He was teachable. And so here he had been tested and proven, and now Paul says, I know that I can trust him to send him to you. The third trait of being a usable gift in the body of Christ, folks, is dependability. Is dependability. People can have talent all day long. But can I tell you, talent is not, and even giftedness is not worth a flip unless it can be depended on. Amen? It's not worth a flip. You know what Proverbs says? Proverbs says, it's better to have working for you an, an apprentice, that is a person who is just starting out, than it is a person who knows what to do but too lazy to do it. It's better to have someone who is just starting out than it is someone who knows what to do but too lazy and undependable to do it. Folks, there's nothing like dependability. Amen.